All right, so this chapter is talking about stuff like varying directly and varying inversely and stuff like that. And I've always had trouble with that. So we're going to have to think harder in this section. But let's look at the problem. So the monthly payment P on a mortgage varies directly with the amount borrowed. So let's start writing equations already. So varies directly. And we also just think about how this makes sense. That our monthly payment P is going to equal some number. It's going to be like a fraction, right? Because it's just the monthly payments, like a fraction of everything you borrow. But that's fine. Some number K times the total amount borrowed. And you think about that equation. So in this equation, the more you borrow, the bigger B is, the bigger P is, right? That's how this is going to work. So that makes sense. So then they tell us that if a monthly payment on a 30-year mortgage is 665 for every $1,000 borrowed, okay? So they tell us there, this is just like an SAT questions we were doing last night. So 6.65 equals K when you borrow $1,000, K times 1,000. So now we can solve for K because we just have to divide by 1,000. So how is that? 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 3, dot, 0, 0. So now that we know what K is, now it's like we know our whole equation, that P is 0 0.0066, pardon my squiggle, six five K or B and then they tell us so find a formula that relates the monthly payment P to the amount borrowed B that's what this is right here P equals point zero zero six six five B and then they tell us find the monthly payment P when the amount borrowed is a hundred and twenty thousand so that's pretty topical because that's probably about how much you might borrow to buy a house or at least your first house so 0 0.00665 times 120,000 and this would be a calculator problem probably so 0 0.00665 divided by 120,000 and that's not correct because what we wanted to do was multiply by 120,000. So 0 0.00665 times 120,000. Boom. 798. About 800 bucks. Your monthly payment's going to be 798. So that makes sense. So that's the big thing about this section, I think, is we're going to be writing equations like this and then like plug it in values we know to find that K value. So let's do this one. So the maximum weight W that can be safely supported by a two by four varies inversely with its length L. So think about it. last time it just said like, what did it say last time? Last time it said it varies directly here. It varies inversely. So what that means is when one of them goes up, the other one's going to go down. And then when it goes down, the other one's going to go up. So let's think about if that makes sense here. Because they're talking about the maximum weight W that can be supported by a 2x4 based on its length. So they're looking at this picture here with your big block in the middle. And this like plank is sitting on two pillars here. And so what they're meaning then, and this makes sense intuitively, is the smaller that plank is, the less weight that it's going to support. Right? If that's just really, really wide, it's not going to take much weight in the middle to break it. But if those pillars are close together, then it's going to be stronger. So that makes sense. The longer the length, the less weight it can support. The shorter it is, the more weight it can support. So how do we write that as an equation? Well, if you remember up here, we did P equals K times B. So for this one, just instead of being K times B, it's going to be divided by B. So we'll, we'll use this, the variables here. So W is K divided by the length. So that's our equation. Now we can probably find the K value because it says the experiments indicate that the maximum weight a 10 foot two by four can support is 500 pounds. So we'll say that when the weight is 500 pounds, the length is 10. Well, then we just multiply both sides by 10. We get that K is 5,000. 
So don't be afraid about the big numbers here. That's just what's going to happen in real life sometimes. So now we have the W equals 5,000 divided by L. That's our equation. So that's our general formula. Now we want to find the maximum weight when it's a length of 25. So that just means our length is 25. It's just 50, or it's 5,000 divided by 25, which is like 50 divided by 25, which is 2. So the answer is 200. And so that makes sense. It got longer. It went from supporting 500 pounds to only supporting 200 pounds. So now we're going to do this one. There's a few more variables involved in this one, but it's going to work the same way. So let's define our variables too. So we've got the loss of heat. I'm going to call that L. Varies jointly with the area of the wall. I'll call that A. And the difference between the inside and outside temperatures. So since there's only one temperature we actually care about, that difference, I'll just call that T. And so it says it varies jointly with those. So that means that L is equal to A and T. A times T. Because if it, just, if it varies just directly with both of them, we can just multiply them all together. We still got the K in there as well. But then it varies inversely with the thickness of the wall. I'll call that W. So just like before, if it varies inversely, that means you're divided. So we just have to divide that whole thing by W. And that's how all those are related. That the loss of heat through the wall is equal to some number K times the area of the wall times the difference in temperature divided by the thickness of the wall. Very nice. All right, so let's look at this one. So the force F of the wind on a flat surface positioned at a right angle to the direction of the wind. Don't really think any of that matters, actually. I think we just care about the force. Varies jointly. So that means we're multiplying. So we have our K, our constant, jointly with the area A and the square of the speed, which is V. So they just say in the square of the speed. So that means V squared. Oh, and that's it. So F equals K times A times V squared. And then they'll give us some information. So a wind of 30 miles an hour, what was that? The velocity? So 30 squared. So make sure we're all in good units too. Oh gosh, we're definitely not. Maybe the units don't matter though, right? Because the units will just be captured in the K. That's probably true, actually. So a wind of 30 miles per hour, so 30 squared, blows on a window measuring 4 by 5, so that's 20. Well, that's it, right? And K has a force of 150 pounds, equals 150. So then we just have to divide by 20 times 30 times 30. So we're going to cancel out this 30 and make that a 5, cancel that out, make that a 4. So K is 1 over 20. 1 over 120 is 4 times 30. So that's our formula is A V squared over 120. And then what is the force on the window measured by 3 feet by 4 feet? So that's 12. Ooh, there's the 12. And a wind of 50. And then it's going to be divided by 120. So we cancel those. We cancel those. So V squared... No, that's the force. The force is 250. That's what we wanted. And 50 miles per hour. Yeah. That's got to be right. Because the K, we didn't even have to worry about the units. Because the K just squeaked them all out and fixed it for us. So if it's not miles per hour, it's like newtons or whatever. Let's make sure that's right. And then the units we didn't have to worry about. Yeah. Perfect. And they didn't even consider units at all. Beautiful. Beautiful. So we're just as good as the textbook, which at the end of the day is all we can hope for.